from downtown Milwaukee, welcome to Money Talk with Bob Landis. Each week, professional advisors from Landis and Company Investments discuss the latest financial developments, offering timely insight and long-term perspective. You're listening to Money Talk for July 9th, 2021. The Brewers host the Cincinnati Reds this weekend, and the Bucks, down two in the series, come home to the Forum on Sunday for Game 3 against the Suns. Something is off with Sacramento's water. Because of the historic drought, the extreme heat, and no precipitation, residents say the water smells and tastes a little earthy. And we're talking about water here, not Chardonnay. Politicians, sensitive to the problem, suggested that the people should just add lemon. (laughs) <laughs> Next election year should be pretty fun. From Florida, a 71-year-old man threatened a pastor with a gun. He believed the pastor was having an affair with his ex-girlfriend. They don't report her age, but because it's Florida and he's 71, I'm guessing her age to be about 30. And we're not done with Florida yet. A woman whose name really is Booze crashed her car into a Taco Bell sign while driving drunk. I think that's called poetic. (laughs) A would-be bride called off the wedding mid-ceremony because the groom couldn't read the vows without his glasses. And this is the second wedding she's called off. She also dumped the first groom at the altar because he was bad at math. (laughs) Wow. Sounds to me like both those men should feel like they won the lottery. (laughs) And finally, our headline of the week. A majority of Americans say they hate math. They put the number around 40%. (laughs) <laughs> At the table today, we've got Dave Sandstrom, Mike Helsel, Joel Driesing, and wrapping up the week, here's Kyle Tenning. Well, thank you, Jason. Uh, a bit of extra credit for two Florida stories this week on what's a short four-day week. A uh, bit of extra credit for the markets as well, despite a pretty bumpy start. We finished strong today. The NASDAQ up four-tenths of a percent this week, closing at 14.702. The S&P 500 also up four-tenths of a percent, closing at 43.70. And the Dow Jones Industrial Average up two-tenths of a percent for this week, closing up 47 points today at 34869. So we look at the year so far, the Dow Jones now up 15 percent, NASDAQ up 14.4, and the broad S&P 500 up 17.1 percent. So again, uh, you know, maybe a bit of a a rough start to the the week, but uh, continuing to pile on to this year's gains. You know, Dave, as we look at uh, you know, I think a, a number of things that continue to show up in headlines that rightfully worry investors, whether it's uh, China's interaction in our public markets with the IPO of uh, DD last week and then them coming out and essentially pulling the, the app from the app store uh, in China, whether it's, um, you know, VIEs in general that have come uh, under focus or these uh, variable indices and entities which are essentially a way to own Chinese stocks. Um, And China coming out and saying, yeah, maybe we're not going to allow that the same way we used to in the past. And that's a big concern for U.S. investors as we look around the world. But you add in our own government talking about cracking down on big technology stocks. You add in, you know, the Delta variant continuing to rage in communities. And you add in, uh, you know, I think a, a pretty significant concern about inflation. There's all kinds of things to be worried about. And yet stocks continue to march higher. Yeah, Kyle, it, it is really quite impressive when you think about everything that's that's transpired here in the last 18 months and and where we sit uh, with with market levels uh, currently where they're at. Um, you, know, you you bring up a, a lot of different issues that I think all kind of point back to um, excessive risk taking, right? I, I think we have a situation in our economy and our country now for an extended period of time of extremely low interest rates. Uh, and now we have a situation where we have excess cash. So you take that combination of things and, and you eliminate the, the availability of really safe assets that pay you something and mountains of cash. And I think you see it lead to excessive risk taking. And, and the VIA is a, a, an example of people trying to get into markets that typically weren't uh, maybe on the top of their list in the past. I think you look at things like cryptocurrencies or you look at uh, what's going on in the junk bond market today where uh, rates now are paying you less than the rate of inflation and yet people are 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 willing to assume that kind of risk 
you look at something like unicorns, which is, uh, by definition, it's a, a startup business here in the country that has a, a market value of over a billion dollars, um, usually accessed through private equity groups. But last quarter, there were 136 uh, new unicorns out there. There was That's more than all of last year combined. So you're seeing this combination of cash and, and very little on the way of safe investment returns equating to excessive risk-taking. And I, I think it's something people have to really be disciplined to avoid. Yeah, I think we need to distinguish, too, between the markets broadly – uh, and a lot of those risk categories where maybe the risk isn't clearly understood and the you know the Chinese stocks via the the variable interest entity is a, a huge example of something where even professionals are now saying, uh, yeah, maybe we didn't completely understand the risk we were taking here. Uh, there is the possibility that China steps in and takes away this investment opportunity. There is the possibility that the rules change. Um, and we knew that the rules could change, but we operated under the assumption that China wanted our money, uh, and so they wouldn't just go out and change the rules on us. Well, you know, I think if there's one thing we've learned, it's that China's going to do what's in China's best interest. Uh, China's going to do what they have to do to protect their, their interests at all costs, and that might mean that they shut off Western investment for a while or at least slow down the trickle. Uh, and, and, you know, you look at some of these other areas you're talking about, they face similar issues, right? The risks aren't clearly understood, uh, and in particular by average investors. And so I think uh, there's two end results of this. One is that there's going to be a lot of very disappointed people in some of those asset classes. Now, certainly there'll be investments in each that work out. Certainly there'll be some of those asset classes that are uh, wonderful places to be, Maybe not worth trying to speculate which is which, uh, but the second is that as those asset classes start to fall apart, you're going to have money pour out of them, and that money has to go somewhere. Uh, and so, you know, you look at broad markets as a great way to participate in people fleeing risk in other areas, especially if the opportunities in fixed income, the opportunities in safer investments aren't all that great. And so, you know, I think there's a a hesitancy when we look at how far markets have run, when we look at, uh, you know, how much risk people are willing to take in certain areas to go, yeah, there might be a cost to that. Um, I think the cost is going to be borne out by those people who don't understand the risks they're taking, uh, not necessarily by those that are just participating a bit more broadly in markets. You know, Mike, I think we we have conversations every day, it seems like now, about some of the inflationary pressure we're, we're seeing uh, you know, I think the the most important things to remember right now uh, are that a lot of the inflation pressure we've seen has popped up in just a small number of areas. So you look at, for example, the May report, 50% of the CPI increase uh, came from just four areas, uh, and those four areas only represent about 6% of the total basket for CPI. Remember that CPI is a basket of goods that we price on a month-over-month, year-over-year basis to get an idea of how prices change. Um, and we're already starting to see some of those areas where there was inflationary pressure come back down a little bit. And so I know you're in the market right now for some remodel in your house. I know you're looking at lumber prices pretty closely. And that's one of those areas, certainly, where inflationary pressure has uh, had been significant all the way through May and has come back down pretty drastically. But, um, you know, I think, you know, as we talk about the impact of inflation, consumers are feeling it. Yeah, they really are. I, I talk to, that's actually one of the big things I get pretty consistently with a lot of clients is we talk about inf, like the inflationary pressures. I mean, because it's everywhere on the TV shows. And as I've said numerous times on this podcast, don't watch those TV shows. Um, but they do. And so we talk about the inflationary pressures. And like you said, I'm acutely aware of some that are coming down and some are st- that are still around. So the ones that are coming down, as you said, I'm doing a remodel and I am oddly aware of how much lumber has costed. I didn't think I'd ever say that, but I <laughs> I am there and that's coming down, which is a wonderful thing for me and my wife. But the other things that have still come up and things that I've noticed are, I think you mentioned um, one of them to me earlier, you know, like airline tickets, right? And that's ob- an obvious one that's still kind of up. Um, I'm I'm actually just bought an airline ticket. I'm going out to Arizona next weekend to see the Bucks. Hopefully, let's not talk about that right now. But I do have a lot of clients that are uh, traveling again because, you know, people have been pent up for 14 months. They want to go out and travel. And one of the things we talk about is, hey, I 
just booked a ticket to go see my grandkids out in Seattle, the ticket is way more than it was even two years ago when we were just in like quote unquote normal life. So they're very worried about inflation. And I try and just tell them this will all kind of, this will all die down a little bit, but because of the extreme natures of where we are this year to last year, you're going to have, you know, that pop in certain areas, but that'll, I'm not too worried about it overall in terms of long term, but there are some definite worries like that I'm talking to clients about. And can you talk a little too about how, I mean, you set up people's accounts so that they don't have to worry about short term things like, you know, higher airfares for a trip? Yeah, you know, Joel, I think important for clients to remember that if you're paying more for the price of an airline ticket, that money is going somewhere. Uh, it's going to the airline first and foremost to then turn around and pay their employees. Maybe they have to pay their employees a little more because they're having a hard time finding uh, gate agents or flight attendants or pilots, whatever it is. But ultimately, if they can increase prices, it, it goes to their bottom line. And so uh, as we look at where costs are increasing, it's a great place to look to invest. You talk about uh, the financial firms that are involved in the deal making that takes place day to day. Well, banks are a good place to invest when inflation is picking up, when the economy is taking off. You talk about some of the consumer stocks like airlines and uh, certainly the car manufacturers who are seeing the benefits of uh, stronger car prices right now. Those are all reasonable places to think about parking money. And, and that gets back to the, the broader theme of stocks, right? That stocks are a great way to participate uh, in an inflationary environment with one big assumption. And that assumption is that that inflation is accompanied by economic growth. That's what we've seen right now. Certainly that the bits of inflation we see here and there have been accompanied by significant improvements in the economy. I think the, the real concern people should have about inflation is when it isn't accompanied with economic growth because it means that something else is wrong. And so I think as we, you know, we look at what we've seen so far, the potential impacts of transitory inflation, as the Fed keeps using the word transitory, we keep throwing it out there. I think the, the real thing to be paying attention to is what kinds of things are we seeing inflation in? Right now, it's a lot of the travel and leisure. It's going to change, uh, and how quickly do we see those things start to slow back down? We know that if we look out a year, the base effect is going to matter, right? That the higher prices today mean inflation a year from now should be less significant. But more importantly, can we get that inflation back in check sooner rather than later? Joel, we'll have more data on that next week with the release of June CPI. And I think one of the big things that we should be talking about is Let's look a little bit deeper than just that headline number and understand, okay, the things we were talking about last month, are they the things we're still talking about? And if not, what's the new thing that everyone's concerned about? And it's interesting. So, I mean, so people who are worried about inflation, I mean, the, I guess the answer is in the long run, you can benefit from it. In the short run, you've got some more ready cash available to help you so that you don't have to worry about covering a flight or whatever. And, and you know, I, I think it is with the CPI, too. I mean, you know, we're we're concerned about that the inflation numbers, and it's that those, you know, four or five, you know, handfuls of things that are, are raising the the year-to-year the -year, uh, inflation rate. Um, but, but also there's a benefit from higher inflation. And, you know, you and I touched on this a little bit before, but uh, to remember, to remind people that if you're receiving Social Security benefits, that those are tied to the consumer price index. So in, in October, the, the Bureau of Labor Statistics will say, this is how much inflation went up uh, for the last three months compared to a year ago. And based on that is, is how much, you know, your Social Security uh, benefits are going to go up next year. You know, based on the reaction and the performance of the bond market uh, over the last few days, you know, you almost have to ask yourself, is that their their final uh, uh, stamp of approval that maybe we're going to move on from this inflation conversation? I mean, when you saw the money that poured into bonds this week, it's almost as if they said, OK, we're not worried about inflation anymore. Yeah, I think when the Fed consistently says this isn't a concern that we have yet, yeah, okay, short term, you go, okay, maybe maybe the Fed's wrong, and what if they're wrong? But 
you know, the, the, the thinking or the mantra has always been don't fight the Fed and eventually the market's going to come back around and go, OK, well, if the Fed still doesn't see this as a concern, it means they're not raising rates anytime soon. It's safe to get back into the bond market where rates are right now. And so, you know, as you, you rightfully point out, we've seen rates continue to come back down from the high water mark a few months back, certainly from earlier in the year. Yeah, the move higher was abrupt. Uh, it certainly made parts of our portfolios look less attractive than they have in a while. Um, if you held a significant portion of bonds, as most investors should hold a significant portion of bonds to be the stability for their account, um, you, you were looking at a negative number for a little while. Uh, that may have changed for many of your bond funds now. There might still be one or two that are negative, but uh, certainly the, the reaction recently has been drastically different than what we saw earlier. And I think the other big thing to point out kind of where we are in the calendar right now is that we're coming right into earnings season. Um, and, you know, in particular, we've talked, we talked earlier about the importance of banks right now and kind of their role in the economic environment. Banks, one of the first businesses or first sets of businesses to report earnings. Uh, and so it'll be interesting to see just how well uh, banks come through the second quarter, just how much they're willing to talk about dividends, share buybacks, things that they've gotten approval to do now after passing some of the Fed stress tests uh, in the past couple of weeks. And so I think, you know, that that will be kind of the key for what carries us through the rest of the summer really is uh, how does earnings season shake out? Importantly, uh, we're talking about a second quarter in which uh, earnings are probably up about 10% annualized uh, over what the 2019 numbers were for the second quarter. Clearly, uh, you know, you can largely throw away the second quarter of 2020, given uh, where we were. But I think important to point out that we're talking about pretty significant gains, uh, again, 10 percent annualized uh, since 2019 second quarter. So uh, I'm encouraged by, I think, the direction we're headed. If you look at uh, what forecasts for earnings are calling for, they're calling for uh, essentially a, a, a uh, a huge increase, not just in second quarter, but full year. Uh, and that's also supportive of where stock prices are. You know, Joel, I think the, the other big thing most weeks is our economic indicators. Short week, few kind of high profile indicators come out uh, in a short week like this. Uh, but, you know, we still got some new information on the economy. Uh, granted, it's all always dated by the time it comes out, but a few things worth talking about in particular, uh, you know, ISM services uh, number was, uh, I think, something that we tend to look at just to see state of uh, the service sector. Yeah, and that's, you know, the, the service sector is the biggest part of our economy, and, and it actually followed last week's numbers on the manufacturing part of the economy, and it's, uh, it's showing that June didn't grow as fast as May did. Um, that said, it's still growing at a really good clip. Um, the, uh, the, 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 it also showed that um, that expansion is happening despite some concerns that, that purchase managers have about material shortages, about um, inflation, um, you know, the, the prices that they're pay paying for lumber and such, um, logistics and all of the bottlenecks that are happening as, you know, you take a con an economy that was shut down and all of a sudden you start – gearing back up again, and concerns about employment, about, you know, being able to, to hire and, and keep the people that they need to keep their businesses running. I think what's so interesting about the ISM manufacturing number last week, the services number this week, any number of other uh, reports where, you know, interviews are done and people talk about here's why we feel the way we feel – we've identified the problems. You know, sometimes the issue is, okay, something's going on, but we're not completely clear what's holding us back. It seems that everybody's on the same page now about what the problems are. We need more workers. We need uh, supply chain to catch back up with economic growth. Um, and it's just a function of giving us enough time as an economy to get back to a point where those aren't issues anymore. And so, um, you know, there's always going to be something we can't foresee. There's always going to be something that catches us by surprise. But it seems like, for the most part, uh, those individuals that you know are paying attention to these kinds of things, they understand what the problems are. They understand what it's going to take to get there. Kyle, that's a good point, and you know, it also emphasizes the point you're making before about that 
a lot of these concerns are transitory. That, you know, if you know what the problem is and you can identify that, chances are you're going to be able to figure that out somehow if it means you making money or not making money. A couple of other, I think, critical releases this week. The employment reports we get are always top of mind, and and I think even more so now because it addresses some of those concerns. It addresses, you know, employers trying to find people, and um, you know, maybe not as robust as we thought on the labor front, but continuing to see improvements. You know, and th- that's one too that I've been reading a little bit more about, and and especially at first, you know, you heard a lot of concern from the Fed that it's important when people lose their jobs to get them back in jobs as soon as possible and to get them working again because we've seen from past recessions that it's hard to to get people back to the earning capacity that they were before. Um, now I'm reading more that at this point um, maybe it's, it's kind of good that there's this um, mismatch right now between the open positions and the employers needing workers and the workers who are in transition trying to figure out, well, is that the best job I was suited for? Or is there something I can do better? Or is there some place where I can make more money? I mean, because you'd like to think that at some point, and and maybe not in the distant future, you'd you'd hope it doesn't take too long, but at some point, um, everybody's kind of in the spot where they should be, and, and they would be more productive, and they would be, you know, doing their employers a lot better, businesses would be better, it would help shareholders, and it would help the workers. I mean, we're still a consumer-based economy, and we want to see workers do well. And Joel, I think there's still some, you know, pretty good-sized concerns out there in other areas of the employment market. Uh, there's still concerns on the COVID front. A certain percentage of unemployed people right now are still in the mindset that it's not safe to go back to work. And whether it's warranted or not, it's it's a real fear that people have. You also have continued disruptions in, in child care to get some uh, single parents back to work. And then I think you also have to factor in some expanded government benefits that are still being paid out. That's also a bit of a headwind for some people going back. So I think you add it all up, uh, along with what you're talking about with a, a certain skills mismatch or a, a mismatch in, in finding the right people. It's all adding up to darn near 6% unemployment in a world where we have 9.5 million job openings. It just doesn't seem to make sense. But um, but when you boil it down, you can see why it's happening. And Dave, those added benefits for unemployment insurance, a lot of those are expiring in September. So, you know, I, f- I figure that of the 15 million or so Americans who are getting unemployment benefits right now, about 11 million of those claims um, are tied to pandemic-related programs, and those are going away in September. So, you know, we'll find out pretty soon. Um, th- there will be a decision coming, you know, of, of uh, those workers, um, how, to, how to best, you know, get back into the economy. And I think what's interesting about this is we, we talk about how strong economic growth has really been, but we're doing it really with an arm tied behind our back with employees that still aren't back to work. And, uh, you know, I think if you look at runway for growth, which is a phrase that, you know, I think is is apt right here, and, and that is there's room for things to get better. It's not like we've kind of plateaued. The more people you put back to work, the more the, the money makes its way through the system, the, the more we can continue to grow the economy. And so as we see more people getting back to work, you should see uh, that economic growth continue to build on itself. One other number that we had uh, that, that came out this week was the consumer credit, um, d- the outstanding debt that, that consumers have. And we particularly look at what's called revolving credit, and that's uh, credit cards, basically. And that went up in, in May. So um, that's usually a sign of, um, it's used as, as, as an indicator of consumer confidence. If consumers are are feeling that they're confident that they're going to keep their job, that they're going to be able to pay their credit card bills in a month. Um, you know, they'll be using their credit cards more. Um, so it went up in May, but we're still at a level that we were at four years ago. So in, in the last recession, in the Great Recession, it took 10 years to get from where we were spending our credit cards to, you know, to get to that level again. So right now we're four years behind. So that'll take time to, to see how that sorts out. I think that indicator tends to work a little contrary to what most people would imagine and that if you think, okay, more people are putting things on credit, more people are using credit cards, we think, oh, no, these people are you know, spending money they don't have. The reality is we've, we've seen personal savings rates increase pretty significantly. We're seeing 
a lot of net worth, a lot of wealth that's been created uh, recently. And so I think, yes, there is some of that that takes place when, you know, credit, when revolving credit increases, but it's also fair to point out that it's taking place in an environment in which uh, many households are in far better financial shape than they've been in a long time. And real quick, Kyle, like that credit number was the least surprising of any of these numbers to me because the people I talk to, like clients every week, they're, we talked about the travel part of it before, but they're doing stuff. They're getting out there. I mentioned this before. I have a friend who works in a couple different restaurants, runs them, and he is full. And it's like, you know, it's all paid with credit cards. I was out down the Deer District last night. Let's not talk about that too much. Sorry, I brought it up. But you could just see like, more people spending on their credit cards, whether it's traveling, getting together in groups of eight or 10, go, like seeing the people that they haven't seen in forever. So I just, when I looked at the numbers that Joel handed out to us, that credit card like number was, or the credit number was the least surprising to me. Like I could, just from talking to people, I could see that coming a mile away. Well, Mike, I can tell the bucks have hurt you. And uh, we I, wanna, don't, I don't want to talk about it. It's we, a temporary thing, Kyle. Yeah, we want to make sure <laughs> it's transitory. That, uh, Is that what you're saying? <laughs> we want to make sure that we can get at least uh, a couple of wins at home here in the in the next couple of days. So go Bucks, go please, Brewers, please. We uh, we enjoy doing the program for you, and uh, we will talk to you again next week. Thank you for listening to Money Talk with Bob Landis. If you have a financial question you want answered on next week's show, email it to Money Talk at Landis.com. To keep informed throughout the week, visit our Money Talk page at Landis.com. <laughs>